So I want to thank everybody for joining in February's webinar on feeding young, growing horses. Spring is right around the corner. We're going to have mares having falls. It's an exciting time, but it can also be a, be a bit of a nerve-wracking time. So let's just go through um, what we should be aware of and what we should be making our clients aware of when we're feeding young growing horses. We'll start out, you know, there's two different times to consider nutrient requirements. There's obviously that in utero time, which for our mares foaling in January, February, we're kind of past that now, but going forward into getting your mares pregnant again, we really need to be cautious about the, those um, and cognizant of those in utero requirements. And then also those postnatal requirements. Once the foal is born, there is a different set of nutritional requirements. We'll look at some roles of nutrition and then some ideal diets. So we're trying to, when you, when you breed mares, when you breed anything really, your goal is to improve the genetics, improve on the parents and make a better baby. But with horses, most of the time, our goal is future equine athletes. Um, their skeletons grow really quickly in utero and when they're born. Um, those minerals are being deposited in the bone. If you have poor nutrient intake, number one, you have a poor skeleton. This is, goes back to my whole fence analogy. If you build a wobbly fence, it doesn't matter what you paint on it. It's always going to be a wobbly fence. The skeleton is the framework of the foal. You need to make sure that you feed a good skeleton, and that's very, very critical. So when we think about, you know, we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit. And I know we touched on a little bit of this last um, month when we talked about brood mares, but I'm, this is more focused on actual um, implantation and after implantation, you can see that the fertilized egg really has high requirements for calcium and iron and copper and zinc and cobalt, iodine, manganese, selenium, and then all these vitamins. Um, and then after implantation, so once that is implanted, we again have those same um, mineral requirements, add in some cadmium. Um, and again, our, our vitamins are really critical. So you can see before you ever see the foal, it has heightened requirements. Before you ever even think that the mare is pregnant, we've got heightened nutritional requirements. You must make sure that when you're growing a foal, when you're trying to breed that mare, number one, you're feeding the mare to keep her alive, to keep her healthy. But when you look at that mare, use x-ray vision, look inside, you're feeding the foal indirectly via that mare too. So it's absolutely critical that you think of it in both ways. We're feeding the mare to keep her in good body condition and keep her healthy, but we're also feeding that foal in utero. Uh, you've seen these several times, but I think it's really important to go back over this because most people forget that that early gestational period, less than six months, is so critical for vitamins and minerals. We have early embryonic loss occurring in that first 30 days. We need to make sure that we're not changing the feed and we're not changing the environment drastically during that time. So don't get the mare pregnant and say, oh, now I've got to feed her a good feed. You do not want to be changing her diet once you get her pregnant. So make sure that you give her the best chance to get pregnant by giving her the right nutrition and you keep her on that so that we can maintain that embryo. First 40 days is critical. Heartbeat is developed between 18 and 20 days. You can't have a heartbeat without a heart. A heart is going to be crucial for the rest of that animal's life. Copper, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin D, all absolutely critical. Vitamin A comes from fresh green grass. Well, most of our horses don't get a lot of fresh green grass, certainly not getting it this time of year. Vitamin D comes from the sun. I was traveling in Michigan last week, and I don't think we saw the sun once. And they mentioned that in January of last year, they didn't see the sun at all. So adding supplemental vitamin D is beneficial too. Mid-gestation, again, you know, we're getting about 90 grams per day of fetal growth. 
vitamins and minerals, still critical. You can see them. You all have these slides so you can kind of individually look at what minerals and vitamins are critical for each of the organs. These, liver, heart, kidney, brain, lung, bone, these are critical. If you don't have these, you don't have a healthy foal. You need to stop thinking about once the foal is born and we can see it and start thinking about <clears throat> building that critical framework. Late gestation, 9, 10, 11 months. Foals gaining 80% of his body weight, but it's really just tissue and fat. Um, half a kilogram, or that works out to be a pound a day growth. This is where that mare is feeding her foal. She's preparing it for that external life, postnatal life. She's fortifying those fetal liver stores with minerals because we know that the milk is really low in mineral content, so we need to make sure that she's got a balanced diet there. It's not linear. We know that. We know that during this kind of six, first six months of pregnancy, because we don't see a lot of fetal growth, we don't see that horse mare change size. So we're like, oh, sometimes we forget that she's even pregnant. But then from six months on, we have this exponential fetal growth. So zinc, manganese, iron, and copper are the primary minerals that she's going to fortify that fetal liver with. So let's look at some very, very early symptoms of deficiency and how it can affect that fall in utero. As I said, we always focus on that postnatal fall once it's born and, oh, if we don't give it enough copper or zinc or calcium, what's going to happen? In utero is where it's doing the most growth and the most flexible growth. So if you don't give your mares enough calcium, for example, we know from research that a lack of calcium intake in pregnant mares is going to result in a decreased weight gain of that foal and most likely issues with bone mineralization. So we're going to predispose that foal to having poor quality bones. What did I say? The skeleton is the framework of the foal. Low vitamin A during pregnancy affects fetal growth and the health of the newborn. We can have reduced organ weight. If you're trying to breed anything that races, you need a big heart and big lungs. They are organs. You don't want a, a tiny little heart. Lowered elastic fibers, delayed matur lung maturation, Again, you want anything that goes fast, you have to have big, strong lungs. Mares at pasture, vitamin A deficiency is rare, but most of our horses are stabled. So having a vitamin A supplement, a vitamin A in your supplement, i.e. Breeders' Choice Plus has elevated vitamin A. Dac Orange has vitamin A. Making sure that they're on a vitamin mineral supplement is critical. You can see here copper stored in the fetal liver. So we're elevating that amount of copper. <coughs> Once that foal is born, it rapidly uses those stores because by five months of age, it's eating its own food. But these are fetal liver stores. Copper deficiency, we know, can produce bone problems in the foals. Now, this is something I want to point out. We talk a lot about um, algal, marine sources of DHA. I know we're kind of switching complete gears here. And I get the question a lot of times, well, what about kelp meal? Is that a source of DHA? No. Kelp meal is added to a lot of supplements. And I am always very, very cautious of anything that has kelp in it. I will never formulate anything that has kelp meal in it because the iodine concentration is so variable. And the placenta is pretty good at protecting that foal from most toxins, but it cannot prevent the detrimental uptake of iodine by that fetus. Be careful with any supplements that contain seaweed, which you will most likely see it written as kelp. Consequences of iodine intake by the mare during lactation. 
um, increase the incidence of goiter, what's that going to do to the fall? Well, we'll have weakness, depressed muscle development, contracted tendons, um, weak small skeleton, poor leg conformation, weird long hair, um, and then at really high levels of iodine concentration, we just have a train wreck really. So postnatal growth. So this really shows us from birth, well, we've got age minus five months, minus two months, then we're having the fall, four months, 10 months, 16 months, 22 months, and 28 months. And you can see that <clears throat> from minus five months through birth all the way to, you know, three till just before nine months after birth, we have primarily, this is bone development. This is where we're getting most of our bone development. Three months before until nine months after birth, it's primarily bone development. Then from two months of age through 22 months of age, it's primarily muscle development. When we think about the nutrients for that postnatal fall, what's the most thing that we need to feed them? Well, energy is important, but also protein. And when it comes to protein, it comes down to the type of protein that we're feeding them. You've probably all heard of lysine. It is the single most important amino acid for growing horses. And we in the industry use this analogy here. So if we have a whiskey barrel or a wine barrel or whatever you're into, but we have one of those wooden barrels and every slat here or stave is a different, represents a different amino acid. So we've got lysine, methionine, leucine, isoleucine, valine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and threonine. You can see that the lysine one is cut off way down here. <clears throat> you can only put water in that barrel up to the top of the lysine one. Otherwise, it's all going to fall out. What that means is lysine, the amount of lysine in the animal's diet, dictates the use of all of these other amino acids. So if you have 50% of the lysine, the animal requirements, Cut the barrel off all the way around here. This is the amount of methionine you can use. This is the amount of threonine you can use. You can't use more than the amount of lysine that you have. When you increase the amount of lysine, you increase the utilization of all of these other amino acids. So you can see that lysine is the dictator for all of the other ones. Um, is there any normal difference from normal in a HYPP fall? Uh, no, there shouldn't be growth differences in utero with an HYPP fall. So with protein, protein is absolutely critical. Um, let's say we've got these growing animals. These are just basic nutrient requirements, and you don't need to memorize these. But what I want to point out is four months, six months, 12 months, 18 months, how our protein requirements increase. Lysine is absolutely critical. And our growth rate, they grow really quickly when they're first born, and then that tapers off. The milk intake is really high, and then that tapers off too. Um, expected feed consumption by the growing horse. Well, the nursing foal, he's really not eating any forage, but up until three months, around three months, you will really notice him consume some of his mother's food and it could be one to two percent um weanlings yearlings we really bump up the amount of forage to concentrate ratio so by around two years especially if you've got a racehorse we're looking at a 50 50 split forage to concentrate when do you begin feeding a foal well as we've said indirectly you're feeding the foal in utero, but when do you start feeding that um, foal once it's born? You can see the this this is a milk curve here. So what's provided by the mare right around three to four months starts to consist really drop off, but the energy required by the foal exponentially gets more and more and more. So you can see it's right here around three to four months 
really here is when we start to deviate, but we say right around three months is when you really should be supplementing your foal because what the mare is giving them is just not adequate. Well, my mare eats all the food, so what do you do? Well, there's creep feeding options. You know, this is the simplest. If you don't want to build something like this, there are multiple different options. Uh, what's a creep feeding ration going to look like? Well, before four months of old, four months of age, the foal should be offered up to half to a pound of, of a feed a day, um, <clears throat> be it kind of a growth ration or oats. Um, per 100 pounds of body weight. But we, we really want to see fat content doesn't need to be very high. Crude protein, around 16%. Lysine, calcium, phosphorus, energy content, right around here. So we want to make sure that we're feeding alfalfa. Um, the cult grower is going to supply us with the vitamins and minerals, but the alfalfa is going to give us this lysine and crude protein and the additional calories. Oopsie. You can see here that whoops, minerals, bone development, muscle development, milk production, skin, hoof health, hair coat, disease resistance, fetal development, nervous system, appetite, fertility. You just can't get away from the requirements of minerals. They are absolutely critical in every single facet of growth. So growth disorders, we'll touch on these. Developmental orthopedic disease, as we've mentioned, it's an umbrella term and it encompasses all of these different types of growth disorders. Number one, DOD was the number one reason for failure in racehorses to perform in the USA and UK and France. This is back in 2004 and this research back in 1998. I mean, we are way past this now. So this is exponentially increased. 35, the study in, in France, 35% of falls were affected with DOD. Cost in 1998 was $50 million to the industry. So a lot of this comes, you know, we know there's a genetic component, but a lot of it comes from poor feeding. Now, what I want to point out here, these are approximate time of onset of clinical signs and sites involved for developmental skeletal problems. So osteochondrosis. Well, you're going to see it in the fetlocks, in the knees, in the spine. Onset of signs, so the time that you can see it, as early as three months of age. If you can see it and they're having a response in the horse by three months of age, you know that the development of that occurred in utero. Pre-birth was when we, we caused the same with physitis, angular limb deformities, flexural deformities, wobblers. These are all occurring. You're seeing the signs at between one, two, and three months of age. That means the damage was being done in utero by what you were or were not feeding that mare. At birth, only 17% of their bone is mature in a mineral content. By around 60 days of age, the horse should grow at least 75% of their mature wither height. Um, most lower limb growth is, is complete before that yearling phase. <clears throat> Let's look at that bone developed. So in the fetal stage, we've got these um, osteoblasts cause bone growth. It's, it's living in the cartilage here in the middle. It's this spongy bone and they keep developing and development. On this blue here, this is cartilage. So we start out, the limbs are there, but they're all cartilage. And then we start with these osteoblasts in the middle and they start to make spongy bone. So we don't just go from cartilage to rock solid bone. We have to turn slowly turn that cartilage into bone. So we get spongy bone in the middle and it works from the middle all the way out. Starts in the middle and works its way out. And then we get, when we get more mineralization and we start exercise, um, well, obviously the fetus isn't exercising. So the here is just laying down mineral. Uh, we get those, that black region there that's when we really get that hard, compact bone. 
late fetus into the foal here. We've got now that spongy bone has moved all the way out. We've got it here in these growth in the middle here, and we're starting to fill out the ends. Once it's born, now we just have this growth plate here, this little bit of cartilage right here, and then the hyaline cartilage on the ends. This was what snaps off if we have an OCD. But here, this growth plate here, this is what gets inflamed if we have physitis. We also, in the middle, start to develop this marrow cavity. But the growth plate doesn't go away. That cartilage on the end is there now to, to protect those bones. And now you can see this is full grown bone. We've got a big marrow cavity. We don't have that growth plate. That's completely gone. But we still have this cartilage on the ends because that protects, that lubricates, and acts as a little bit of a shock, shock absorber in our joints. So osteochondrosis, calcification of the cartilage did not take place. You can see this little bone chip. It breaks off. Um, you can see it here, how we've damaged here on this ridge. Most common site for OCDs is a stifle or hock. It can happen in the knee, but mostly in the um, bone system, primarily going to happen uh, in the fetlock joint. So this is a normal bone here, and I think I've got, this is our growth plate here. And you can see there's no swelling, normal. But when we have physitis, we have swelling around that growth plate. Four to eight months of age is the most common time frame for physitis. Mainly going to see it. You can see these fetlocks are really wide and, and swollen. Here, 10 to 18 months of age, then the knee will see this physitis develop. Angular limb deformities. You know, we've got this abnormal growth here at the plate, abnormal loading. So we're going to get more pressure on the outside, less on the inside flexural deformities. This is a little bit more expanded than what I show uh, in my regular presentation. We know nutrition plays a role, genetics, injury, stress, disease, but this is a really nice chart here. And you can see it all comes down to this rapid growth. Um, are we overfeeding? Are we cause, is there a mineral imbalance? Is there some kind of toxicity in the environment? Um, is it genetics causing this elevated growth? Is it the hormones that are floating around? Now, this should have an arrow to here too, because nutrition can affect hormones, which can then go down here and infect this. Um, exercise trauma obviously can be all a factor too. <clears throat> Nutritional mistakes are one million times amplified when you're in utero and feeding that fall. Mistakes will reduce your performance potential and your sale potential. Um, energy is important. Minerals, calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc, manganese, all important. Oops, I think I'm going the wrong way. Digestible energy. Um, excess, if you feed way too much, well, we'll increase the growth rate. Put more stress on the bone. Um, feeding 130 percent of the actual energy requirements from falls through 130 30 days of age re inc resulted in an increase in um, OCD lesions compared with a group fed just at that 100 percent energy rate. So be cautious when you have clients who are like, ah, you know, I have a horse. I want to do the futurities with it. Or I want to show it as a weanling or yearling. I really want to put a, a lot of weight on it. That they're overly feeding energy, feeding too much calories, we really can cause these problems in all animals. Um, so we know that when you feed certain types of new grains to mares, you feed high amounts of sugars and starches, you can increase the glucose and insulin in that mare. This is where mare nutrition becomes really important. So the plasma glucose and insulin um, and in those healthy falls was low. So we've got this dark line here. This is glucose. The spotted line is insulin. 
in the healthy foals that didn't have OCD lesions, they've got low glucose and insulin. These horses with these foals that had OCD lesions had really elevated glucose and insulin. A lot of that comes from mere nutrition. But this also goes to some of the research that I did as a graduate student that we need to not feed. If we have a foal that's predisposed to one of these disorders or we're concerned about it, we really need to make sure we're not feeding high sugars and starches to those horses. So if you're feeding them the cult grower and you're currently carrying it on oats, for example, switch it over to beet pulp or alfalfa pellets, lower in sugars and starches. Energy type has a real role. We know that. Keep that glucose and insulin lower. <clears throat> Foals with extreme glycemic response had that atypical incidence of OCD. High glucose and insulin, high OCDs. Um, we, we know from research that high fat and fiber diets are better for, for mares. But just because a horse has high digestible energy in the diet doesn't mean he's guaranteed to get developmental orthopedic disease. We also know that if you feed higher amounts of energy, but you support it with elevated amounts of protein, minerals, and vitamins to support that growth, then we sometimes can get away with it. So when people say, well, I need to keep the protein low in my horse's diet, I'm like, you are causing the problem by doing that. If you want your horse to grow, to mature quicker, and you're gonna feed him extra energy, you have to feed him more protein and minerals and vitamins to support the growth. Because if you have one without the others, that's where we get all these problems. So excess protein often implicated, not by any research, but just by people reading the internet um, or talking to their friends, it's often Im implicated, but has never, ever, ever in horses been supported by research. A high protein diet does not make a fall grow faster and a high in an elevated um, protein in the diet has no role in the incidence of DOD. You want research? Here is old research because we've known this as researchers for years and yet people still don't want to believe it. Low protein, not having enough lysine in the diet can impair growth could lead to DOD. Low quality protein will affect bone and cartilage. So not having enough quality protein will cause the problem, not excess protein. Calcium phosphorol, excess calcium is not generally a problem. Um, it can, if it gets really high, um, <clears throat> interfere with zinc, manganese and iron absorption in other species, but not in horses. Excess phosphorus is only a problem if you don't, if you have way low calcium. You know, the optimum ratio for calcium to phosphorus is two to one. Maximum in um, a growing, uh, uh, an adult horse, we go around six to one, but in foals, uh, we, we like to keep it between two to one and five to one. We don't really like to go outside of that window for calcium phosphorus ratio. Um, if you have deficiencies in calcium or phosphorus, that can cause DOD. I, I'm not going to go through each of these research papers, but I, you have them in the slides. Feel free to reference them when you're talking to your clients about why they need adequate sources of calcium phosphorus. My main point in putting them there is so that when somebody says, well, do you have proof of that? Absolutely. We have documented research. Copper. Deficiencies in coppers can cause developmental problems. Why? Because copper is a big part of the cartilage matrix. It holds cartilage together. Um, and it's actually quite common for us to supplement a lot more copper than the NRC requirement, just because we know as an industry that it's absolutely critical. This was a study done in New Zealand. It's one of the 
um, kind of foundation studies for complements, copper supplementation in, in thoroughbreds. There were four groups. Mares supplemented with copper, but the foals were not. Mares and foals got copper. Mares, no copper. Foals, yes. Or neither mares nor foals got copper. So where you see a C, they were not supplemented. S's, that means they were supplemented. So if the mare received no copper, look how high the incidence of articular lesions was. It all is dependent on that mare. Because here, this is the mare did not receive any copper, but we gave the copper to the foals once they were born. We still have this really high incidence of articular lesions because it's that in utero growth that affects the fall the most. Down here, the yellow ones, yes, the mares received copper during pregnancy, but the falls didn't once they were born. They had really low lesion scores. Yes and yes, there's no actually no difference here between significant difference. Um, but the difference is between the yellow and the blue. If you supplement the mares during pregnancy with copper, Incidence of articular cartilage lesions is significantly decreased. More research. More research. I, I can just give you research after research after research, day after day after day. There is so much research on the incidence of copper and it, it, deficiencies. Um, Deficiencies in zinc can cause DOD because, again, it's also a part of that cell and protein synthesis. Excess zinc may cause DOD as well. So why? Because really, really high amounts of zinc can decrease our copper and calcium absorption. The copper not seen so much in horses. but um, <clears throat> So we don't want excessive levels of zinc. Standard bread falls, 122 falls feeding program. The mares didn't get any vitamin mineral supplementation. 50% of their falls had OCD lesions. 28% of them had lesions in one or more joint. This is a you know 10 year old study, and this is a bunch of falls. Equine research do usually doesn't have this much, um, these this many numbers. This is a huge study and you can't argue with these numbers. You know that there's huge interaction between minerals though. You know, look at this line here. We've got zinc inter interacting with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different minerals. Calcium, one, two, three, four, five, six different minerals. Um, so we know that we have to make sure that we're feeding minerals that are really bioavailable. When we, we, oops, we use proteinated minerals, uh, because not all chelated minerals are the same, so we're going to attach these proteins so that the way you explain this the easiest, a mineral in the intestine has one door it can go through. There are mineral doors that you can absorb through the intestine into the bloodstream. But when you attach a protein to it, now we can open the mineral doors and we can open the protein doors so we can just have much more um, bioavailability. Again, just, you know, when we're looking at nutrition and when we're seeing it, um, these are just some possible causes. So what are we going to feed these horses? Well, um, you know, oftentimes we recommend early weaning so we can have 100% control over that foal's diet. We're going to reduce the energy somewhat because we just want to make sure that they're not their body weight isn't getting overdeveloped, so they're not carrying a lot of extra weight on those limbs. And we're going to analyze the diet. So oftentimes we'll do a little bit of stall rest to prevent any extra damage. And the DAC cult grower, absolutely, and the cobalt, manganese, and zinc copper, manganese, and zinc, sorry, in the CMZ paste. So we often use this PACE diet, <clears throat> um, controlling energy intake, maintaining protein, minerals, and vitamins. Um, it's a common mistake to take away all of the grain because oftentimes that grain, 
supplies the vitamins and minerals. So we don't want the cereal grain per se that's going to give them extra sugars and starches, but we need to make sure that we're still supplying them with vitamins and minerals. Look at this diet here. We're limiting the energy. Um, we've got free choice grass hay. We've added a little alfalfa. And you could do alfalfa pellets so that you can carry your dat cult grow. Everything's meeting and or exceeding the requirements for this horse. So in summary, we need to make sure that when we think about feeding foals, we remember when the foal starts in utero. Feed the mare to keep her healthy, but also feed her knowing you're feeding the foal. Adequate nutrition makes sure we have strong, healthy foals. Questions? No questions. Great info. Thank you. Um, I'm going to. Oopsie. Un, hang on, Terry. I think, Susie, Susie you were going to say something. Yes. Um, I just recently had a question. I've got a, a client with a maiden mare that we've got started on the Orange Superior back in September for her first breeding, which is going to be in March. Um, the breeding farm, she's on Orange Superior and the Foundation Formula. The breeding farm where she is going to be bred and where she will carry her full full term feeds the LMF su super supplement. Su yes. Mm -hmm. um, and their question was, should she continue on with her orange and her foundation formula or will she be getting adequate with the super formula? Um, as far as the orange, it would be overkill if they're feeding adequate amounts of the super supplement, but she absolutely should stay on the foundation formula. Okay. And it, it should, it then we'll just get it balanced out. That's great. That's what I needed to know. And then when Thank she comes you. home, she can easily just transition back to the orange. Okay. And then I had another question. Um, sorry to be a hog, mm -mm. but I had a customer that swears up and down that when she used to order the colt grower, that it was only two scoops required and that we've gone to three scoops because it makes us go through the product faster and they have to buy it sooner. Oh gosh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we get these kind out in the field. Um, I, I explained to her that I thought... Um, I, I understood from you maybe a year or two back that there was an increase because we've gone to more natural supplements and the product was reformulated for the natural vitamin E or something that was in the cult grower. Is that true? And that's why we increased it for the yearling to three scoops? I will go I back will through all of my catalogs because I don't think that we've increased the amount that we're feeding. I think we're feeding the same as we always have um, since I've been on board anyway. It's two scoops for a horse that's three to 12 months of age. And over that, from 12 months to two years, then it's three scoops. So okay, uh, okay. I'll go back through all my catalogs, but I, I don't know whether I believe that. Okay. Thank you, Tanya. No problem. Any other questions? I do have a question. Sure. What is your ideal carrier from when you first start supplementing? Um, it great. depends. If we're not concerned about growth problems and you feed oats, then sure, go ahead, feed oats. Um, if you have alfalfa pellets or beet pulp, then you can carry it on that too. It, it all depends on what's in your facility now um, and what we're feeding. You know, if we're feeding warm bloods, for example, then I'm less likely to carry it on oats, to be frank. I'm more likely going to do alfalfa pellets or, or beet pulp. I have a client, she breeds halter quarter horses, and she currently feeds everybody on alfalfa. Mm -hmm. And she has a, he's going to be a yearling. And her veterinarian recommended that she take him off everything hot because he's starting to have some growth issues. Mm -hmm. 
What would you recommend? Jason? What else is she feeding him? I mean, the alfalfa is low in sugars and starches. I can't see the horse's body weight, but if he's too fat, then we need to get his body weight under control. Um, but she should never, never, never stop the cult grower on that horse. She'll make the problem worse. Okay. And he's currently for the carrier grain. She's feeding him strategy GX. No, too much sugars and starches. And her veterinarian recommend to pull off of the alfalfa and feed grass. <clears throat> Um, and, and part of that may be just like I am not seeing the horse. The veterinarian did see the horse. So he may be mm -hmm. seeing in the horse's body weight. He's too fat. The grass hay has less calories, so it'll help bring down the calories. But if he's making that statement because he thinks the protein's causing it, then that's just silly. Okay. And as far as if she switches from strategy, what would you recommend along with the grass hay? Go to like alfalfa pellets or? Yeah, she could do alfalfa pellets and carry it on that. Okay, thank you. Got another question here. I feed my broomers Neutrina, Mare, and Foal. They are Appaloosas. This is the first breeding season. I'm using Orange Superior. My mares look great, but this is this an okay combination? Yes, absolutely a good combination. Um, where does CMZ paste play a role, play into a malnourished foal? Um, it's not going to make a foal any bigger. It's not going to put body weight on him. That's where you're going to use oil. And if you have a malnourished foal, you have to be very careful to slowly increase the body weight. Um, the CMZ paste, if you've had a malnourished foal, you may want to just give them, you know, a week or two week course of that just to make sure that we give them the vitamins and minerals that they need and try and ward off any growth issues. But uh, what do you recommend for a good growth grain product or not? Uh, it, again, it, it just depends on the horse that you're feeding. If you're feeding horses that have a predisposition to rapid growth, um, thoroughbreds, standard breds, warm bloods, where we know we're concerned about um, growth problems, then I'm going to steer away from a lot of my growth products and go more with like an alfalfa pellet and put the cult grower on it or a vitamin mineral supplement um, pellet. But if I've got, you know, horses, quarter horses that I'm not necessarily concerned about, then, you know, feeding a growth, mare and foal growth product isn't, isn't a problem. So do you recommend when the foals start eating grain, do you recommend continuing the orange or something else? Um, the foals really should be on the cult grower. It's formulated for a young growing horse, not the orange. So if your mares were on orange and the foals just start to nibble at the mare's food, when you start to transition the foal over to their own food, you should really get them going on the cult grower. You can start the cult grower as early as 30 days of age. Typically, we recommend starting at about three months of age, though. How much yucca would you use for physitis? Well, ph yucca isn't going to help physitis per se. What it will do is bring down some of the inflammation. Um, and whatever's written in the catalog, I don't remember the um, amounts off the top of my head, but... It'll bring down inflammation. The other thing is the DHA Perform. Um, you know it's more potent than the yucca as an anti-inflammatory. Um, for a mature horse, the yucca, it's one ounce a day. I'd feed a young horse an ounce a day too or, or half an ounce a day because it's got some other minerals in it. At what mm -hmm. age do you recommend weaning? Again, it depends. Six months if the horse is fine. Three months if, the, if we've got some issues and we want to really control the diet. Other questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.